For the entire half hour, Nora Rubini. Damien, I'm going to tell the story as quickly as I can. You brought it up earlier, which is the idea of where Dr. Rubini was in 2005. One night at Davos, at the Belvedere Hotel, I sat in the old bar, not before they the old bar. they fancy eyes yeah. it. It was the old wooden bar with dust and, you know, Valdery, Valdera. And Dr. Rubini and I sat there by ourselves, and just around the corner of the bar was a guy named Geithner. And Geithner just listened. He didn't participate in the conversation. And Norrell and I went through the excesses of 2005, 2006. And within that, folks, and forget about interviews and speeches and all that, over a quiet beverage of our choice, he laid out the next 72 months like nobody I've ever seen. That's right. It was such a privilege to have Mike Bloomberg pick up the bar tab <laughs> as I met with Nora Rubini in 2005 or six. Why don't you bring well, in well, the esteemed uh, Rubini? Dr. Rubini, you probably don't remember this, but in 2007, when I was at Citigroup, I was working for uh, Mark Bohr and Chris Pace. Shout out to you two. We had uh, some traders in from Tudor, from Soros, and we were at Mr. Chow's downtown in Tribeca, and you were talking about this now. Fast forward, this is not 2005, this is 2007. You're talking about the global financial crisis, your call, and these traders were all over you saying, you've been calling through this forever, you, you know, whatever. So talk to us now, you know, talk to us about where we are now in the economy. Where's growth <clears throat> expectations now with disinflationary pressures kind of bubbling up here? Where are we in the cycle? Uh, well, where we are in the cycle depends on whether you're in the United States, in Europe, in Japan, or China. Probably you cannot generalize it, but I would say if we start with the U.S., it's been an interesting evolution because about a year ago, most economists thought that we'll have a hard landing. Then people said there'll be a bumpy or softish landing with a short and shallow recession. Now the baseline became one of a soft landing, but the economic data on growth have a surprise on the upside. And I would say that paradoxically, the biggest risk today to the market is actually is a case of no landing where growth could continue to be above potential. And why is it going to be negative for the markets? Because if growth remains above potential, the Fed is not going to cut rates starting middle of the year. It's not going to cut rates three times this year. They could cut only two, one, maybe even zero. And I would say paradoxically, the best news for the economy may be the worst news for the market. So we've gone from hard landing to bumpy to soft to maybe no landing. For our audience, let's just be clear here. This is Professor Norio Rubini talking, actually bullish on, on growth expectations on the U.S. economy, on U.S. exceptionalism. Yeah. Let's talk about some of those I, other I'm, elements. I'm optimistic of, about growth, but paradoxically that optimism about growth implies inflation more sticky mm. and bad news for the market, at least on a cyclical basis. So you were just going to take me there, right? Yeah. I mean, 75 bips priced in now through year end yeah. here in the U.S. I mean, has the market got it right? Or, I mean, should we expect perhaps the risk in the pain trade to markets being that the markets are pricing in still a bit too much. Yeah, the markets have been always too dovish. You know, uh, last year, as you remember, they were expecting that the Fed would cut rates, uh, or even in the second half of the year, the Fed said no, and the markets were pushing the Fed, and then the economic data remained strong, and actually you got a right. correction, 10% in August and September. Uh, then this year, they started the year saying six rate cuts, the Fed told us <laughs> three, now they move to three rate cuts like the Fed does. But as I said, the possibility is that if the economy remains stronger, generally data on inflation were strong, <coughs> that then the Fed right. doesn't cut in June, doesn't cut in July or later, and doesn't cut three times this year. It could be less than three times. And that could be right. the negative surprise for the markets. I'm going to go to some of the gloom that is out there, and that is a buildup in our fiscal position. You advised Bill Clinton in another time where we measured billions. We now measure Dr. Rubini in trillions. We have American <laughs> exceptionalism. We have our technology. I've got the IMF with a growth view out three years that looks Rubini-like, to be honest. But the elephant in the room is the debt buildup in America. Maya McGinnis, among others, expert on this. Do you study the debt and say it will upset the apple cart? Or can the debt be tolerated by American productivity and growth? 
Well, the first two chapters of my new mega threats are about debt and debt crisis. Actually, the first chapter is called The Mother of All Debt Crisis. And I point out that not just in the U.S., but also globally, there's been a rise in private and public debt as a share of GDP. In the U.S., the sum of the two is 420% of GDP. And while the average debt ratio for the public sector is 100% of GDP in advanced economy, that's the official debt. On top of it, there are implicit liability coming from aging of population and social security pay-as-you-go systems or healthcare system also pay-as-you-go. So that implicit debt is another 100% of GDP. Now, the paradox for the U.S. is the following one. If you're another country, Greece, Italy, even UK, and you're fiscally deviant, you have right away market punishing you. Your spreads go higher. If you have exchange rates, why don't flexible. We face that, why don't we face that discipline? We don't face it because you have the exorbitant privilege of being the largest reserve currency in the world. <laughs> and that paradoxically means that we can borrow longer and cheaper right. to finance our fiscal and external deficit. But that means that right. eventually the market is giving us enough rope to hang ourselves even longer. Okay, I want to I want And eventually with once this the shock We're, occurs, It'll be in We're going to finish with a thought with Dr. Rubini and then come back. Damien's got a loaded oh, effort got a on loaded China question. here in the next That's right. hour. Dr. Rubini, you just talk about exorbitant privilege, which is just started to staying of old yep. word France. Yep. It's Barry Eichengreen out at Berkeley, and critically, yep. it's a laureate Stiglitz, yep. where there's an implied assumption our growth rate will stay ahead of our real rate, whatever, however you want to measure it, that the growthiness will be there. Do you suggest our American growthiness will still be there? Uh, it's a mixed bag because on one side, I think that technology, AI, innovation could increase potential growth. But in my book, Mega Threats, I talk about 10 medium long-term negative aggregate supply shocks that can reduce growth and increase uh, inflation that are stagflationary. And whether technology is going to dominate, probably over the medium and long term, yes. But for the next decade, I think these mega threats, whether it's global rivalries, okay. deglobalization, climate change, pandemics, high private and public debts, the return right. of inflation, those are all risks to economic growth. Nora Rubini, quote, the Looney Tunes Roadrunner could sniff out dynamics in gift wrapping. Why can't we? Nor Rubini there, starting <laughs> mega threat strong with the Looney Tune as well. What about the Roadrunner in China? With these two meetings coming up, Damien Sassauer, yeah. you wonder what our intelligence is, our knowledge of present and future China. Well, I mean, you know, Tom, you like to reference dollar yuan, which is trading 721 on the offshore. But what I like to look at in China is the 10-year yield. The 10-year yield is at 235 2.35%. It's one of the uh, lowest yielders given in, all the their world, problems. That's in the world. In the world. And so, Noriel, I want to ask you about that. I mean, talk to us about Chinese deflation. What does that mean for somebody sitting here in New York City or, more importantly, somebody sitting, you know, elsewhere in this country because New York's very unimportant at this point in time? Talk to us a little bit about what it means for your average everyday American deflation coming out of China. Well, it means uh, a few things. Uh, there's deflation in China because there is excess supply of goods, services, real estate uh, compared to demand. And the implication for both uh, Chinese inflation and global inflation are deflationary through three channels. Channel, channel number one is that China is going to, unquote, dump this excess capacity of goods in global markets. And that puts a downward pressure on uh, global prices. Secondly, the Chinese currency is weakening, means the dollar and other currencies are strengthening. You import uh, less inflation from China. And three, a Chinese growth is 2-3% effectively implies less demand for commodities that put downward pressure on commodity prices. So weakness of Chinese growth is uh, disinflationary, not just for China, but is also disinflationary for the global economy. Now, you could say it's good news, but the bad news is that this excess capacity is being, unquote, dumped in global market. There is already protectionist pressures, and this protectionist pressure are going to become more severe because the last thing that the U.S., Europe are going to be accepting is Chinese exporting their excess capacity by ever widening trade deficits with these countries. Well, Dr. Rubini, I mean, take me through this. I mean, is disinflation enough? I mean, you've, you've pretty much said it. I mean, is disinflation enough to move Chair Powell's hand, to move the Fed's hand here in the U.S. and get them to start cutting rates, say, by the middle of the year, which is what markets are sort of projecting right now? Well, uh, the channels through China don't have a huge impact yet because we're not importing as much. I think what matters Headline. for the U.S. is going to be 
headline inflation. And as I pointed out, if we're going to be in a no landing scenario as opposed to a soft right. landing, growth is going to remain above potential. Inflation is going to remain sticky, and the January number confirmed <coughs> that. And that means that the Fed may not cut rates even in June and may not cut right. rates three times this year. And if that happens, actually, the stock market is going to correct. Stiglitz said that's the biggest risk to the market, yeah, actually. No landing. Trade. We had globalization with a few people discontented. I would suggest many more are discontented, including the leadership in Beijing. What's the next globalization look like for you? Well, I think we're in a process of gradually less globalization. We went to hyper-globalization now. Even if we don't have real deglobalization, we're going to have uh, French shoring. We'll have reshoring. We'll talk more about a fair trade and secure trade rather than a free trade. We'll have some fragmentation of the global economy. We'll have just-in-case rather than just-in-time global supply chains. We'll have uh, reshoring and French shoring rather than <coughs> offshoring. We'll have emphasis on economic security rather than efficiency. So it's a process, right. call it of de-risking or decoupling, right. but it's ongoing. It's going to continue over time. Just out of, just because of the huge response out, of, particularly on YouTube live chat, Nora Rubini right now on the dash of Bitcoin, the idea of it's in ETFs, we can put it in our retirement accounts. I believe it's a limited, scarce resource. Obviously, the price is going up. What's the quality of the price increase in Bitcoin right now, the nature of it? Listen, Bitcoin used to be 10,000, went to a peak of 69,000 late in 2021, then fell to 15,000, now it's above 60,000. It's so volatile, it can go higher, it can go lower. And by the way, not just Bitcoin, but the entire crypto space, they call them cryptocurrencies. But anybody who knows anything about currencies, money, monetary policy knows these are not currencies. For something to be a currency, it has to be a unit of account. Nothing is priced in Bitcoin. It has to be a scalable means of payment. You can do only six transactions per second with Bitcoin. You can do 50,000 with the Visa network. It has to be a stable store of value can go up by 10% one day, can go down 20% another day. And it's to be a single numerator, so we can compare prices of different goods and services. It's not a unit of account, it's not the scalable means of payment, it's not the stable store of value, it's not a single numerator. So whatever they are, you cannot call them currencies. They are not currencies. No, I, I agree with that. So <laughs> that, that's a fact. And even the supporters of Bitcoin don't anymore believe it is going to become a means of payment. Nobody's using it as a means of payment. Nowhere around the world. Even El Salvador, where Bitcoin was made legal tender, the amount of transactions on goods and services that are using Bitcoin is less than 1%. It is a legal tender. People are not going to use it for uh, transactions, period. Yeah, no, I, I mean, Dr. Rubini, you said El Salvador, you're taking me exactly where I want to go. I want to talk about the geopolitical risk premium that is or is not embedded in markets, specifically as it relates to these elections we're seeing, right? I mean, we've seen quite a few elections already year to date, and we're going to see some big ones coming through. I'm thinking India, I'm thinking South Africa. I mean, talk to us a little bit about election risk in the market. Should investors be concerned about that? Well, there are tons of elections, even in important countries. But let's say in India, Modi is going to get reelected. The only yeah. issue is by which margin. Uh, and I think that the global impact even of stuff happening in South Africa is going to be minimal. The ANC might have less power or more power. We don't know. The only election that matters for the global economy and markets is the U.S. election. And it matters not just because of geopolitics of what are going to be the foreign policy of Trump relative to Biden right. on China, on Russia, Ukraine, on Europe, on the Middle East. But most importantly is his economic policy. He has said, mm -hmm. I'm going to impose a 10% tariff on all imports right. coming to the U.S., when the average tariff is 2%. He said, I'm going to impose tariffs on China of up to 60%. And he, is, he said, well, I'm going to also renew the tax cuts right. that I pass. It's another $1.5 trillion deficit over the next decade when the deficits are out of control. So I think the fiscal risk and the trade protection risk could really derail the market mm -hmm. and slow down economic growth and increase inflation. I, That's the biggest risk coming from Trump. I got 42 seconds. What was a book when you were a kid that got you going in economics and international finance? What was the book that changed Nora Rubini when you were a kid? Well, there was a book by Jeffrey Sachs that was uh, on the stagflation of the 1970s, where we had the all shock of 73 right. and 79. It was the first book that spoke about the term stagflation and was the period of time exactly where you had lower growth, 
Perfect. recession and inflation. Right. And now we're facing 50 years later, similar stagflation depression. I'm so gonna put, was that, really put that book out on Twitter and LinkedIn and I've got another Jeff Sachs book where he was way out front on the dumbing down of America. Noi Rubini, thank you. It's thank been you. way too long. Now that you're Professor Emeritus, <laughs> he's holding time. court. He's over at the St. Regis Breakfast or the Regency Hotel Breakfast. He's, he's very Emeritus. <laughs>